let's read Matthew 1.18. Uh, I've stopped in Genesis to, to do a little discussion that's correlated to my Genesis account. We were in Genesis uh, 2.18 through 25. This will go along with that study. And so I'm, I'm just extending that in a different way. Uh, 18 through 25 in Genesis 2.18 through 25. Now I'm in Matthew. But in Genesis 2.18 through 25, you have the discussion on uh, the origin of marriage and how it works and all of that. So uh, I'm going to Matthew 118, uh, dealing with uh, the conception and birth of Christ, okay? Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. And it's going to, it's going to take up a couple chapters. Not today. <laughs> We're going to do with one verse. But when he says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows, see, he's just come off a long, a long genealogy. In the first chapter, he's gone through 1 through 17 as a long genealogy. And to get to the birth, there's quite a, a, quite a messianic history. There's quite a messianic history behind the birth of Christ. I mean, he didn't just show up one day. And that's what the point of the writer. The point of the writer it goes all the way back to Abraham through David. We're going through a lot of history, a, do, a documented history, that Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Messianic Savior of the world. So when the writer opens up, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. We're down to the event in human history that has been spoken about for centuries. I mean, actually, this whole thing about the birth of Christ began in Genesis 3.15. Think about that. That's before we even counted time. And he says, now the birth of Jesus Christ. And I say, historical event. We live in the historical event of the prophecy of the Messiah coming to pass in a person called Jesus of Nazareth who is the Christ child. And so Matthew opens this subject up and is going to cover a, a couple chapters. And I'm covering one verse. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. And he uses the word when to document a point in human history. See, we've gone through this long genealogy covering centuries. And now he says, now the, now the birth of Christ has become a historical event. We know a person, place, thing, etc. And he uses the word when. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was a follow when. This, this is where this point in human history began. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, that's one point, the second point, before they came together, that's another point. He's talking about sexual, uh, the sexual act between them as a husband and wife. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. That's three points about when the birth of Christ was as follows. And he uses a historical when, uses a historical when, His mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. That's the first part of the win. The second part of the win, before they came together, in other words, consummating their marriage sexually, she, third, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. You see that? All of that's attached to the word, words, to the word when, to the subject which is, now the birth of Christ was as follows. When? Point one, point two, point three. And what happened, and this is the story from Joseph's side, what happened, it turned Joseph's world upside down. To such a degree that only God could turn it right side up. 
What I want you to understand today in my lesson is there are some times in your life when your world gets turned upside down to such a point that it seems virtually impossible to ever write it. You understand? And listen to me. My point is this. God is always there for you. He's there when the world was this way. He's there when the world is that way. And He's there when the world is that way again. Because we are promised in the 13th chapter of Hebrews that He would never leave us nor forsake us. And that's a wonderful promise to us. We may go through enormous problems in our life. There may be circumstances in our life that are so devastating to us at a point that it seems like our world has been turned upside down. And that's the story of Joseph. When he introduces what turned Joseph's world upside down is in verse 18. When Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together to consummate their betrothment of marriage, she was found to be with she was found to be pregnant. But Joseph at that time didn't know by the Holy Spirit. What turned his world backside to the right order, upright, was when he was told by God that that was a prophetic fulfillment of Christ. When he believed it, his world got turned back. Side up. So let's have a word of prayer. And I'm going to go into this study with you on verse 18. I'm telling you, there are times in your life, it has, if it has not come, it will come. It is not a bad thing, it is a good thing. Because of Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love God. Joseph's story is a story of that very principle in his life. He thought his world was done. And God turned it right side up. <clears throat> the two miracles happened. One was conception by the Holy Spirit and the other was Joseph's faith that turned his world right side up. Two miracles. Let us pray. I gave him a moment of silence as a believer priest, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's the great teacher, John 14, 26, of truth. His desire is to cycle it through your mind into your heart so that it becomes a principle of faith for you to live by, because we walk by faith that comes by hearing not by sight. In order for the Holy Spirit to have great ministry in the teaching hour, there can be no unconfessed sin in the Christian life. 1 John 1, 9 would take care of that. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us that restores us to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue would be at least three categories to consider in your priesthood and to make confession about before we study. You do that in silence. And so, our Father, we come to you today thankful for our life in Christ, the journey that we've had in Christ to this day. And we realize that sometimes the world that we're expecting to be one way gets turned upside down. And only God can turn it right side up. But it requires faith on our part. We by ourselves cannot, cannot correct a sinking ship. But God Almighty can. He proved that with Jonah. He can do that if it's done by faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the truth of the Word of God and believing it and applying it to our life. We're thankful to report, as the Scripture says, that Joseph did that. 
And over the weeks to come, or the next couple of Sundays, we will show how he corrected a sinking ship. That we might be able to do that if we're caught in a sinking ship. We feel like there's no hope. We're going to drown. But then there's God. There is God who has never left me nor forsaken me, who will right the ship. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a look at this passage. Joseph and Mary are betrothed. They're scheduled. They have a wedding date set. They are ready to get married. As soon as she returns from an emergency trip to the hill country of Judah, probably somewhere around Hebron, because her, her aunt Elizabeth in her senior years is having a baby, barren all of her life, is now having a baby late in her life, and the family members are concerned about that, and so they've selected Mary to represent the family to go be with Elizabeth in her last tri-semester of her pregnancy. We learn about all of this out of Luke, not Matthew. We learn about this all out of the first chapter of Luke. When you read, as I put on your paper, Luke 1, 24 through 26, 36, 39, and 56 would carry you through the events I just mentioned. So it would be important for you to, if I put scripture on your paper, it's important for you to study it somewhere other than today. I only have one hour. So... When Mary returned home from spending three months with Elizabeth until Elizabeth gave birth, the last tri trisemester of her pregnancy, she gave birth. Mary returned home to bring a great report about Elizabeth and was three months pregnant. That turned Joseph's world upside down. Everyone who knew Mary's relationship with the Lord and she must have had a good one because God told her right off the bat in Luke that she was highly favored. He told her a lot of things about her character that she never understood, that God declared to her is why he chose her to be the mother of the Messiah. You need to read Luke 1 and 2. They're really important. If you want the background to the story of how God felt about the woman that he had picked a virgin girl from the tribe of Judah, from the house of David. <clears throat> well, everyone who knew Mary's relationship with the Lord was shocked when they learned that Mary could be pregnant. No one more shocked than Joseph, wondering how was this possible? How could Mary possibly do this to us. I imagine everybody that thought about Mary thought about how of all the people I know, Mary would be the last person I would ever suspect to ever get involved in something like that. That's how strong her reputation was as a believer in Christ. Today's lesson will study four aspects of dealing with God's will regarding issues that can seem bigger than your life. You're going to have these. There's no way you're going to get through here without it as a spiritually advancing believer because this, listen, when these when the issues of your life get bigger than your life, that's the time God shows up and shows out. I mean, the, the, even if God has to perform a miracle beyond natural laws of science, he can do that. You don't ever want to think that when your world gets turned upside down that you have to turn it right side up. That's the business of God. Your business is to stay steady 
in your faith with God and let him do that for you. He will show up and show out. That is for sure. So, I want you to really understand when God reveals his will to you, your world may not get turned upside down because you're an active participant in it. But maybe people close to you, their world gets turned upside down. And so how do they deal with it? Mary's dealing with this deal pretty good. Joseph is, is devastated. He is not happy about this. Mary's happy that she was chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. He's not happy with this at all. Because all he sees is a pregnant woman, three months pregnant, that went off to visit Elizabeth and came back pregnant. How is that possible? So here's a doctrinal principle. Listen, here's the idea. Either Mary is pregnant by fornication or by a miracle. Now that's a pretty big pill to swallow, isn't it? Unless you have the Word of God to back it. Do you agree with that? God, you've got to prove to me that this was an act of God and a miracle, right? This is when God shows up and shows out in your life. Can you save my marriage? Can you save my family? Can you save my business? Can you save my church? Can you save? Can you save? Listen, God's in the saving business no matter what the category. Would you agree with that? God is in the saving business. You've got to believe that. This has got to be priority in your life as a believer because you're going to come across these things. And do you believe God? Do you believe God? Do you believe that he's there for you? Do you believe he's always on your side? Do you believe, do you believe Romans 8, 28? That all things are just some things. See, you got to believe it all. You got to believe it all. And so here is a, a first doctrinal principle. Because either Mary is pregnant by fornication or miracle. Agreed? That's, that's, Joseph hasn't even put the miracle on the table yet. Because he doesn't have any scripture to back that. So God is going to give him the scripture to back that. And the point I'm going to make to you, scripture always turns your world side, right side up when it's wrong side. We'll turn it right side. God is faithful. Listen, you need to grab 1 Corinthians 1.9. God is faithful, and he is always faithful. <clears throat> Doctrinal principle. Before we jump upon our high horse and ride off in every direction on the issues bigger than life, we should ask, what does the Bible say? When you begin to pull your hair out on something and go, oh, get in that state of mind, the first thing you ought to do is stop that foolishness and ask yourself, what does the Bible say? Lay that problem up there and find out what God says about it. You don't have a problem that God can't solve. You don't have a problem that God can't solve. You've got a problem you can't solve. But it's not bigger than God. So, you should ask yourself, and then you should become one who searches the Scriptures. You should search the Scriptures. You should get you a study Bible that has a good concordance in the back and begin to look up. Is it possible? Joseph, let's get back there and let's look at or everything the Bible has to say about virgins. Is it possible for a virgin to have a baby? And let's, let's narrow it down. Is it possible? Does the Bible cover that? Does the Bible cover a girl from the tribe of Judah and from the house of David? Let's see if God... Is that not detailed? 
We're not just looking, we're going to search the scripture. We're not looking for just any girl. We're looking for a virgin girl of meritable age from the house of David, from the tribe of the tribe of Judah and the house of David. Does the Bible say anything about being able to get pregnant with it, without a male? They a virgin <clears throat> conception. Exhaust your study, Joseph, and let's come back and talk. Is that not fair? I'm going to hunt for it, you hunt for it, and we'll call a couple other people to hunt for it, and we'll see if we can find it. Right? Because Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, and that's what you have to apply to your life in order to walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. <clears throat> Had they done that, you suppose they could have found that scripture? You suppose it was in the Bible? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. All of your problems that need solutions are in the Bible. Where, where are they? Where are they? In the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me, right? We teach it to our kids and don't live it. <clears throat> All right. Danger. Here's a danger that we fall into. It's a big trap the devil has. And we're talking about all this on Tuesday. <clears throat> it will help us if we search the scriptures and look for doctrinal answers. <clears throat> it will help us from making false assumptions. Joseph made a false assumption. That leads to a false interpretation, which it did. <clears throat> leads to a false expectation, which it did and leads to a false application, which he was about to make. And God intervened and gave him a heads up because he wasn't looking in the scriptures. So God sent a teaching angel to him to tell him to go get your Bible. Get your Bible. Well, I don't think I got any reason to get a Bible. I know what happened to her. She fornicated on me. Go get your Bible. Go get your Bible. Is there anywhere in your Bible that you can find a virgin, meritable girl from the tribe of Judah and from the house of David that's going to be the mother of the Messiah? I don't know. Are you interested if, if, there is, if we could find her? Are you interested to know who she, her name would be? I guess. Well, go get your Bible, because I'm not going to teach you without a Bible. Go get your Bible. Okay. I don't see what that's going to help. Well, I don't know, Mike. I'm Gabriel. I don't just come down here to blow smoke in your face, Bubba. I'm Gabriel. Da, 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 da. I'm Gabriel. I've been sent here on a mission to you to teach you the Word of God. Get your Bible, son. Get your Bible. Okay. Can you find Isaiah? Yes, I can find Isaiah. I won the contest several times for get, getting to the fastest book in the Bible. Okay, get Isaiah. Okay, you got Isaiah? Yeah. Turn to the seventh chapter. Okay. And verse 14. Because there it is, son. There it is. A Jewish virgin meritable girl from the house of David in the tribe of Judah. There it is. The problem that Joseph had, he didn't go to the Bible, just like you. 
you grumble and gripe and you sweat, you can't sleep at night because you're worried about some problem that you can't fix because you don't go to the Bible. You don't have any confidence that God will take care of that. Your confidence comes by faith. Look. Write this down in your paper. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Because if you don't go to the Bible, you won't find faith, because faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God, Romans 10.17. Therefore, you got nothing to apply to your problem. You got nothing. If you don't go to the Bible and find a categorical Bible doctrine that fits the problem, you don't have anything to go on. Come on, people. When they looked up Isaiah 714, just like the Gabriel the angel told him, he found the answer. He found the answer. Here's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Watch this. There's two parts to it. You know the faith cycle? Watch this now. I'm not going to turn this stuff on, but look. Go, go clockwise. Somewhere in your paper, write H. That's for hearing. Go to believing. Go down to 6 o'clock for application. And then go up to, to what? Nine for completion. And go clockwise. Romans 10, 7, hearing the word of God. Hebrews 4, 2, you've got to understand and believe it. Once it does, it, it is, becomes your faith. It becomes your belief. Now it's ready for application. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Now we go to completion. That's James 2, 22. That's when God shows up and shows out. Now watch this. Have you got that on your paper? Draw a line through it like this. Up here, is, up here is hearing and down here is application. Draw a line this way through it. Are you with me? I bet people at home are having a tough time with me, uh, listening to me, aren't they? All right. Now, 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 go, to, now go with me to Hebrews 11.1. I'm going to show you how it works. And this is why you have to go to the Word of God, because faith comes, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God, and then, the, then faith begins to work in your life in a magnificent way. Okay? Here's what Hebrews 11, 1, right in the middle of that circle that you have by hearing, believing, that, you ought to put Hebrews 11, 1. But here's what it says. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, that goes on the side, put this on the side where it says hearing and believing. It goes on that side. Assurance goes on that side. The assurance of things what? Hope for. On the other side of that line, which goes from application to completing, on that side, put the word conviction. Because Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen. Do you love that? Not yet seen. But when God shows up and shows out, what he told you to believe is going to come to pass. And you're going to get a chance to see it by faith. The whole system works. See, assurance. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Joseph has got to put his eyes on the Scripture to match his problem, the categorical doctrine that fits his problem. And when he does, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things yet not seen. The conviction. The conviction is what holds you tight until God gives you. Listen, when she comes home uh, three months pregnant, he's still got nine months, to, he's still got, what, six months to go, right? He better have something solid to hold on and not be a wreck. In the meantime, when she's about ready to give birth, they've got to make a long journey 
a long journey, not by an ambulance or by an automobile or anything. They got to make a long, a long journey from Bethlehem, uh, from uh, uh, Nazareth, from Nazareth to Bethlehem, because that's where God says He's got to be born. He was conceived in Nazareth and by the Holy Spirit before she ever left to go, and has got to be born in Bethlehem by the word of God. They didn't even second guess it. Now, sure, I know they had a little encouragement from the Roman census. Joseph, is there any place in the Bible that talks about a virgin girl of meritable age from the tribe of Judah and from the house of David? Yes, there was. Isaiah 7, 14. God sent Gabriel, the, the great teaching archangel of heaven, down to earth just to visit him to get him squared away on the word of God. In Matthew 1, 23... I'm, I, we read verse 18, but the answer was given. Behold, the virgin, the virgin shall be with child. She shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, translated God with us. That message was given to Joseph to correct the error of his thinking. And listen, God does that to you when you go to Bible study. Is Gabriel doing Bible study with him? Joseph's in Bible study. <clears throat> All right. Joseph might have said, yeah, but that's just one verse. <laughs> I hear that every once in a while. Yeah, but that's just one verse. Yeah? Yes, it's just one verse. It's like one verse like old little, old little town of Bethlehem. One verse. Micah 5.2. I mean, how many verses you got to have to prove that the, the, the authority of God in his word? One verse is enough if it covers your problem, agreed? It's not if it doesn't. One verse ought to cover your problem. If it doesn't, then you look until you find several verses that cover your problem because they're there. One verse covered the problem. One covered the verse, well, why should I go to Bethlehem? What's the Bible say? Oh, little town of Bethlehem. We're still going to be the birthplace of Christ. Because why? Because of the seed of David, the house of David, the house of David, the tribe of Judah and the house of David. <clears throat> See how important the Bible is? Do you see how important the Bible is? Listen, the Bible's got to be the most important book in your library. It's got to be more, but the Bible has to be more important. Listen, I don't know. I can't even think anything even to compare it to in my mind. One prophetic verse, yeah. One prophetic verse. Yes, yeah, like little old town of Bethlehem in Micah 5 2. Listen, you when you read, look at let me show you how one little verse. <clears throat> In Matthew, the second chapter, I wrote down verses 4 through 8. The Magi, we three kings of Orient, right? Show up. A year after the birth of Jesus Christ. King Herod, nutter than a fruitcake at Christmas. He calls his top people in, his top theologians, and say, where is the Messiah the king of Israel going to be born. Well, I got three guys out here who say that the king of the king of the Jews has just been born. If you know anything about King Herod, you better not come up with an answer that you can't back up. Because he just kill you. You didn't come in with any bad answers. He may pay you good, but <laughs> you better come up with the right stuff. You know where they went and found it? And they know better than to bring up something that's true. Because these guys want to know. They've come to visit him somewhere in Jerusalem, somewhere in my territory. They've come to show up. I want to know who they come to see. Is this possibly true? 
they'll come back and say, yeah, Bethlehem of Judea. The three wise men go off, and you know the story. That's Matthew, the second chapter of Matthew. I put it on your scripture. I put it on your paper, verses 4 through 8. In Luke, the second chapter, listen, how many verses did they find? One. They found Micah 5, 2, right? They, find, they, found my, they, they went to Micah 5, 2 and said, here's how I know. Are you sure? Are you, boy, yeah, are you guys sure? And they went, mm, yeah. In Luke, the second chapter, 4 through 7, we have a Roman census. You know where, where they got the, where the, you'd better show up if Rome told you to show up and pay your taxes. You better show up. Don't make me come and get you. You know what they went by? They went by the records of the Jew, what the Jews just said was at Bethlehem. That's where they went, knew where to go. One verse. Ah, I tell you. It, listen, is God not magnificent? He wrote it. Listen, 500 years before he wrote this, 5-2 five, five, five of Micah 5-2, you think he's in control of history to make sure it comes true? Oh, geez. Yeah, it's true in your life and mine. How about John 10? How about John, the 7th chapter 42, when he says, has the, the populace of the nation, the populace, the people who are out on the street listening to Jesus, you know what they said? The populace, when they, when they talked about it, the populace said, hasn't the scripture said? Talking about who the Messiah is. Well, hasn't the scripture made it pretty clear that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, is the Messiah, the Savior of the world? You know what they picked? They, they picked a Messianic verse. How did, how did they know it? They said, well, listen. He was, he, he, the people said, well, listen, he was, uh, he, he was born in Nazareth. They go, no, he wasn't. He was born in Bethlehem. <laughs> no, he wasn't. They went, oh, yeah, that's right. And who did they have? Listen, they had Roman records and Jewish records to prove that Bethlehem was where the Messiah should be born and was born. And that's something. I mean, how important is the Bible to you? should be the most important book that you've ever read in your life. We must examine everything outside the natural creative laws, even a miracle, in the plan of God, especially if it's associated with Jesus Christ. Can this man heal the blind, the crippled, the lame, raise the dead? Is it possible that man does? I don't know. What's, what's the Bible say? Have you ever read Isaiah? Huh? Have you ever read the book of Isaiah? Have you ever read the book of Psalms? If you read just those two books, it'll, it'll show you the pathway of everything the Messiah has to fulfill to be the Christ, the Savior of the world. Let's look at a second point. Mary became pregnant while in Nazareth before leaving to visit Elizabeth by the Holy Spirit. Luke 1 when you study Luke 1, 26 through 39, you realize that conclusion. It would be important to the when it occurred. Right? She comes back to Joseph, and she's three months pregnant. Well, wait. Wait a minute. When the family, I'm talking Joseph's side for a moment. Wait a minute. I was with I when Mary came to, when Mary said the family wants me to go visit Elizabeth. What do you think about this? Well, let's talk about it. So they had this great discussion, like like a, an engaged couple might have, about her leaving on the eve of their marriage and going off for three months to be with Elizabeth in her third trimester. You know they have had to have that conversation. <clears throat> Don't you know 
that this couple was spiritual, that they had prayer over this. They had talked about it. They felt together that it was the right thing for her to do because Elizabeth was up in age and having a child, and it was going to be difficult, and she, they needed Mary there. You know there had to be that. And so Mary goes, and she comes back three months pregnant. Is there any possibility, Joseph, that were you with Mary a week or two before? Well, listen, we were inseparable. No, once we found out, well, like the last three weeks she was with him, we were inseparable. I mean, if, if we were, there were, I was with her the whole time. I know I'm not the father. I am sure I'm not the father. I don't know of any opportunity there could have been here, so it must have occurred over there. And so he's taken that assumption. You say, well, I can't really blame him. I know, but he's a, he's a believer, and he should have first done what? Before he jumped on a horse and ran off and rode off in every direction, right, which is confusion, he should have done what? He should have opened the Bible, opened the Bible, and see if that's possible. Why do you jump on a horse when you get in a big issue in your life, you jump on a horse and you ride in every direction at one time, which is nothing more than confusion? Why don't you stop, sit down, shut up, and open the Bible and read it? Look for what the issue is and see what the Bible has to say about it. Well, I don't know anything about the Bible. You don't have to know anything about the Bible. You don't have to be a scholar of the Bible to get to truth. You got saved by the gospel, which is a small, a small part of the Word of God. It's a big part, but it's a small part when you look at volume. Mary. Mary said to the angel when he said, you're going to, to give birth to the... If she says, how am I going to give birth when I'm a virgin? How am I going to give birth when I'm a virgin? How can this be since I'm a virgin? So he gives her details. You, that's what you're looking for in the Word of God, details about your, about your issue. Listen to what he said. The angel answered, this is Gabriel now, he answered and said to her, one, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That's the way it worked in the Old Testament. Number two, well, when he comes upon you, the power of the Most High that's God the Father, will overshadow you. And for that reason, in other words, there's going to be a fertilization of her egg by the Holy Spirit, by the sovereignty of the will of God. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. That's when she said, the angel said, look, you're, you're going to have a baby. She said, ah, <laughs> uh, and how will that work? Because I'm a virgin, and I won't be a virgin until I, I get married. So how's this thing going to work? And he said, well, since you ask, God gave her the details. Now, they're pretty amazing details because it defies all natural law, doesn't it? It defies all creative order. Listen to me. That's what a miracle does. That's exactly what a miracle does. I had a science professor at Western Michigan that was an atheist. They didn't believe that at all. So he preached against God in the Bible and his classes. I wasn't a believer, so I, I didn't give a rip one way or the other. I was after a grade. I didn't care what he believed about God or didn't believe about God. I didn't care what he, you know, j just give me a decent grade and I can move on. 
how can this be? And so he gave her details. He gave her, we would call it points of detail of a doctrine. Two miracles in the Bible that always interest me. One is the surgery that God did on Adam and then fashioned a woman out of his rib. <laughs> that's a medical miracle. I wonder how come that's not in the medical science. That ought to be in medical science, shouldn't it? I mean, how's that possible? I'm always tr intrigued by that because the last thing I want to do is have an operation. I don't care what he's going to get from it. You could have got me in a hospital to take my rib out, and I don't care if he's going to give me a thoroughbred horse to win a Kentucky Derby or whatever. You ain't going to open me up for that. So it's just kind of interesting. Of course, they had to put him asleep to do it, but I understand that too. The second one was God fertilizing Mary's egg by the Holy Spirit to produce Emmanuel. Now, how can you explain that? It is a miracle. How do you explain healing the blind man from birth or the women with a woman with an incurable blood disease, or the list goes on. The dividing of the Red Sea and holding the water back and them crossing on dry land. How do you explain that? Defies the law, the natural order of creation, the natural laws. See, God can do that. And listen, not only can do it in what we might call high points of theology, he can do it in the smallest points of theology because it all works off from the Word of God in your life. None of it does it. All of it works off from the Word of God in your life. There would be no parting of the Dead Sea without faith in Moses that God could do that. There would be no parting of the Dead Sea. There would everybody be swimming and drowning. Let me close this out. Mary's pregnancy brought about a lot of controversy and conflict to her life. Doing the will of God had become a nightmare. All of a sudden, the moonlight and roses has turned to daylight and dirty dishes. I mean, she did not expect this. But here's what she said that's really important out of Luke. She said, Behold, the bond slave, when he told her exactly, laid out the plan for her, she said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. You know what it means, be it done to me? The directive will of God said to her, You're going to be the mother of Messiah. God is going to fertilize your egg by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to give, you're going to be pregnant, a normal pregnancy and a normal birth to an unnaturally born child, the Son of God. <clears throat> that a hard pill to swallow? That a hard pill to swallow? <clears throat> it was for my professor. There's no way you're going to swallow that pill. <clears throat> Doctrinal principle. Watch this, watch this, watch this formula. I'm going to give you a formula. Pay attention to it. The word of God takes you to the will of God. The will of God takes you to the work of God. The Word of God takes you to the will of God. The will of God takes you to the work of God. You must understand that. When Mary addressed herself to God as a bond slave, she understood that principle. She was declaring, not my will, but your will be done in my life. When she said, be it done unto me, is what she said. <clears throat> It declared how she would approach the big issues of her life regarding the directive will of God, <coughs> i.e. her pregnancy. What kept you steady during this whole time, Mary? She said, I could not have done it had it not been my faith in the word of God. I guarantee it. Mary, what kept you What kept you? going crazy during this period of time. The Word of God. 
my faith in the word of God. God promised he doesn't lie. He will, he will walk me through it even if it's the shadow of the valley of death. That's what I believe. And I believe that Mary is one of my heroes among many women in the Bible. I think Mary had a wonderful grace attitude as a candidate for marriage. She had the bond slave mentality to the will of God. Be it done to me according to your word. This is how we're to live. Stop panicking about everything in your life. What does the Bible say? Grab a hold of it and trust it and let him turn your world right side up. It does not have to, you do not have to be in chaos. Well, that's as far as I can get today. You can read number four. I only got three. You want to read that, though. <clears throat> we'll come back to Joseph next week <clears throat> and look at divorce. We've looked at marriage and a proper relationship prior to marriage. <clears throat> what, a wonderful, what a wonderful woman candidate Mary was for marriage. And so was Joseph. Once he understood the priorities for his life. Gentlemen, the priorities in your life should be the word of God and you ought to be able to stabilize your wife through it. And stabilize your life. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come in attendance today in the first service. We pray, Father, as we take an offering uh, to our people, we would be good stewards of it, spend a little on ourselves and most on it, reaching the uttermost parts of the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you would encourage our hearts this Christmas. What's the Bible say? What kind of decisions are you all, are we all wound up and frustrated about whether it's at work or marriage or family or whatever. What's the Bible say? Let us find that scripture, Father, that we can put our faith in to allow you to work through that issue in our life and bring us to a wonderful conclusion that all things work together for good, that those who love God those who are called according to his purpose, his divine plan, in Jesus' name, amen.